From the heart of history come the many chapters on man and money. In preview, we wish to speak of money and what man has done to it. The experiments through the centuries in search of the ideal form of money have included feathers, shells, sticks, stones, clay tablets, and even the basic and more necessary food commodities. But without quality being uniform and durability and scarcity weighing in against so many other options, gold and silver became money over 2,600 years ago and remain so until recent times. In the history of money, we find an important, but today neglected chapter on gold. Gold is merely a means of exchange. Through time, the marketplace voted two commodities as ideal means for exchange, for their scarcity, durability, portability, and by market decree, a conduit of transferring value with integrity from one person to the next. Gold is not just a commodity or element on the periodic table. Through history, it's been kept by individuals and nations as a store of wealth, as a means of barter and exchange. It has all the qualities of money and for millennia has been treated as such. Simply put, gold is money. Wherever and whenever gold was used as money, economic volatility diminished and political ambitions were restrained, scarcity having a number of benefits. First, it forces politicians to pay attention to the realities of a budget, and of course, it sets natural spending limits. Under a gold standard, there were far fewer currency crises. Banking and currency crises were rarely linked, while under the present fiat system, the number of currency crises has increased dramatically, many of them being caused by problems in the banking system. But today, the manipulation of our currency, devaluation just being one element, is a tool for the banking and Wall Street elite to maintain their self-appointed roles as economic engineers. Thus, we transition from a rock-solid gold standard to something far less stable, a paper substitute. Paper automatically presents itself as a compelling substitute for convenience sake. Why carry around a chest full of silver coins to conduct one's affairs or risk the thief taking your satchel of gold? Paper was and is more efficient. The ease with which it is used suggests also the ease with which it's created. As long as its printing is limited to representing something real and actually scarce, then it stands with integrity as a receipt for real money. The problem begins when you find a way to cheat the one-to-one -one paper tangible relationship. Money represents the labor and effort it took to gain it. To print without effort is to cheat the labor of a man and, and suggest that Ponzi schemes are preferred to production of real things. Today, the world's central banks print and issue credit, creating value out of nothing. We can imagine how pleased the alchemists of old would be. The true alchemists of our day don't change lead into gold, but paper into something that glitters for fools. In the absence of a standard and stable monetary system, we suggest gold remains a vital reserve for businesses, for families, for individuals. Simply put, gold is money. It's money you can trust, having found politicians and bankers always gaining an advantage via the current unsound paper money system. In the absence of sound money, greater vigilance in the political and economic spheres is required. Sound money generally is sound only when the government cannot create any more of it, says Richard Duncan. Now recall that the purpose of owning gold is merely a secure money deposit. It's private, it's portable, outside the reach of a centrally planned and typically corrupted paper monetary scheme. The stated goal of our central bank is to have the dollar maintain purchasing power, that is, price stability. Yet over the last hundred years, the dollar has fallen by 97%. Hardly a success story. Our complacency is tied to low rates of inflation that seem harmless, never looking at their cumulative effect. What if you were saving for a new home? Recall that our central bank's inflation target rate right now is about 2%. At the end of 10 years, you have to save 22% more to compensate for a 2% inflation rate. At a 4% compounded rate, you would need to increase your targeted savings by 48% to reach your goal. At 6%, which is hardly a catastrophic inflation rate, after 10 years, you have to add more than 80% to your savings to reach a simple down payment goal. 
low rates of inflation, or anything but harmless. So the aim of having gold is either to maintain or increase purchasing power, ideally a rise in the effectiveness of each ounce you own. What is of value to you? A piece of land you can grow things on? A house in which you can share life with family and friends? What about a company providing a product or service that makes the world a better place or providing jobs for those in your community? Your secure money deposit in the form of gold ounces is secure in order that it may be of use to you in the present or future. Any of these things mentioned may be more desirable than a hoard of ounces, money in the mattress, so to say. That is its ultimate purpose, to be deployed towards some productive end. Savings are empowering for one's future hopes and dreams. Having your own gold standard in the absence of an official monetary gold standard must be a part of planning for the future and ensuring that your purchasing power is not eroded, that your dreams are not dissipated by the standard inflationary practices of central bankers and their fiat money printing. If you assume as we do that gold is a constant and other asset values fluctuate up and down around it, you'll see gold volatility in a different light. We'll address volatility in the gold market in a minute. Let's consider a few examples of gold and silver enabling an increase in buying power. The gold to house ratio. We'll focus here on the preservation of purchasing power. A modest house in the early 1930s cost roughly $4,000. In gold terms, this was about 200 ounces of gold. The number of ounces it takes to buy a home fluctuates, but has steadily improved over the last decade, even as home prices saw their best ever rise. In fact, today, if you look at the average single family home, an existing home, guess what it costs? In gold terms, roughly 200 ounces. Through time, gold represents a preservation of purchasing power, but an increase of purchasing power in certain instances. Another historic relationship is the gold to Dow ratio or gold to stock market ratio. Your gold ounces now buy you better than four times the number of shares in the Dow than they did 10 years ago. Keep in mind, equities have set new highs. Yet in gold terms, this was the golden decade, not the period to chase returns in equities. We estimate that during the next decade, gold will improve your purchasing power another four times. Gold to oil or gold to gasoline, other relationships where you can see an improvement in purchasing power owning gold. You have something as basic as bread, the gold to bread ratio, if you will. Over a long period of time, it's said that an ounce of gold will buy you 300 to 350 loaves of bread. Looking at wheat, we can see that in spite of a radical increase in the price of wheat, Gold has still allowed the average consumer to pay for their basic needs and stay ahead of the increase in the price of wheat, and therefore bread. Ounces are an insurance that your hard-earned resources, your savings, are not subject to the deliberate effort to shrink their purchasing power via the issuance of trillions of new bills, what we know as inflation. Guilio Gaurodi in Monetary Regimes in Transition says that interestingly, the monetary orientation of politics has changed over the last century from one of stable money to one of inflation. With the politicization of the budget through the rise of the welfare state and the electoral impact of unemployment, inflation has become a fundamental means through which elites gain and maintain office. Michael Bordeaux comments that governments have incentives to inflate. They gain revenue from money creation, and they also want to win elections. Fiscal issues in the US and around the world center on this issue of overpromising to one generation of voters to garner votes at the expense of a future generation. In many instances, this is nothing more than a demographic time bomb. You've got entitlement promises that can be far larger than the next generation can afford, leading to debt crisis or accelerated inflation rates. Super and hyperinflation obviously being the worst possible outcomes, though low probability. In politics, it's the creation of money that is the root of all evil, says Richard Duncan. And from Santiana, Progress far from consisting in change depends on retentiveness. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Then we have what we call the global race to debase. Global economic growth over the last 30 years has been astounding. Now through free trade and open capital flows, there is an element afoot which has opened the door to a new currency war. 
you can measure the world as one productive unit, global GDP. Look at it as a pie divided between well-established economies and less developed economies. What everyone wants is to maintain their slice of the pie, if not increase it over time. If the entire world economy is growing, then everyone peacefully makes an effort to grow in lockstep and not to the detriment of any other trade partner. But as we've seen in recent years, when the global economy shrinks, the entire pie is smaller and politicians the world over fight to maintain the old slice, even if it hurts a neighbor or a trade partner. In order to keep people employed and maintain an export advantage, exchange rates can be and are being manipulated lower. Ironically, the success of globalization has reduced the cost of many consumer products, but is now prompting one of the world's first global inflations, driven by central banks' default role as central planners for the world economy. Inflation, or the race to debase, increases dramatically in periods of financial stress and strain as politicians abuse monetary policy in order to maintain social and political stability. This notion of a currency war is not well understood, in part because of our current system of fiat money, that nothing backing it. It allows for relative devaluations to be hidden from plain sight. As an example, if two countries devalue simultaneously, you have no decrease in the exchange value of those two currencies, though the currencies, in the end, do not purchase the same quantities of goods and services as before. As investors awaken to the threat of an extended currency war, not only is inflation hedge demand for gold bound to increase, but investors also seek to protect themselves from geopolitical disintegration. Currency war is a hybrid of hot and cold wars fought with financial and monetary weapons instead. There are two types of demand for gold, investment demand and consumer demand. First, we'll consider the sources of demand and then the limited supplies in a moment. There are various forms of investment demand. You have inflation hedge demand. History is filled with example after example of failed paper money systems. Europe, Africa, South America, Asia have all experienced high and even catastrophic rates of inflation. Specific countries, Hungary, Germany, Zimbabwe, Argentina, Iran, and many more countries have experienced these events and are now extra sensitive to the savings of a generation being wiped out. Therefore, they tend to prioritize inflation hedges. The second form of investment demand is deflation hedge demand. Deflationary statistics are far more supportive for a hedge even than inflationary statistics, but investors still buy it as an inflation hedge. As our friend Adrian Day has said, in a deflation, by definition, the value of money goes up. People save and hoard rather than consume, and people tend to save the best credits, which means gold rather than paper. Gold is no one's liability, unlike paper money, and it is the preferred choice of savings and deflations. Gold can also have an extra boost during deflations when they're accompanied by, as they often are, by monetary crises. In Roy Jastrom's book, The Golden Constant, he points out, a number of instances over the last 500 years in which gold has done very well in the context of deflations. 1658 to 1669, you had the price index down 21%, and the purchasing power of gold increased 42%. Between 1813 and 1851, with the price index down 58%, the purchasing power of gold increased 70%. From 1873 to 1896, with the price index down 45%, you had purchasing power in gold terms increase 82%. And most memorable, 1920 to 1933, with the price index down 69%, purchasing power in gold terms improved by 251%. The third form of investor demand comes from political uncertainty, with one out of every five tax dollars committed to interest payments. It will be tempting to maintain other services, that is entitlement programs, by running deficits and issuing additional debt. At some point, however, investors will recognize this behavior for the Ponzi scheme it is. Thank you, Barry Eichengreen. Household demand for gold seems to increase in proportion to the interference of government in the economy. When government allows the free market to function, people would rather have their money working for them. Money gets quiet when government interference increases. It goes underground until it gets an all clear for growth. 
when reward comes back into the light of day and risk and reward are in balance. Capital mobility is critical to avoiding the illegal plunder of desperate states. If you haven't already moved money to a non-home country, you remain one of the masses that will be coerced into compliance with some non-legal or non-moral bureaucratic dictate. The fourth trigger for investment demand is geopolitical uncertainty. You have hot and cold wars and they drain the resources of an economy. They're typically accompanied by major devaluations of a currency. 50 to 75% devaluations are not uncommon between countries in conflict. If a conflict affects strategic mineral reserves, the global inflationary impact can be severe, even more severe. As tensions rise, free trade contracts and global economic growth can be affected as well. The fifth cause of investor demand is hedging against systemic risk. The troubling fact is that events of the last five to seven years, which are like that once in a hundred year flood, are no longer separated by a hundred years. Even months and years are now where we see catastrophic events. Following the Commodity Futures Trading Act of 2000, the derivatives market has grown from 100 trillion to one quadrillion, a tenfold expansion. Any miscalculations in this arena will be catastrophic. Gold has been and will again be an ideal hedge for systemic risk. It's one of the rare assets that's completely separate from the financial system, yet with close enough ties to be used as a tool, monetary and investment tool. Tail risk, as it's now popularly called, references the tails on a probability curve. Like any bell curve, you've got the majority of events which are one to two standard deviations away from the middle. Moving further from the center of the bell curve implies a lower probability of occurrence, multiple standard deviations away. What prior to 2008 might have been a theoretical exercise is now very well understood. Losses that were caused by internal derivatives meltdowns with just a few firms involved, AIG. They put other firms and their counterparties at risk and required taxpayer-funded bailouts in the billions. If not contained quickly enough, trillions were at stake, but still are. Why are low probability events occurring with greater frequency? Then you have the other non-financial risks, which can destabilize the financial and or commercial systems as we know them. EMPs, electromagnetic pulse, chemical or biological terrorism, to name just a few. You have complexity and interconnectivity, which have ratcheted up the need for systemic risk insurance. The sixth form of investor demand is from central banks. It's unlike other investment demand as it does come from official governments and central bank purchases. And this is when central banks seek to stabilize their reserves by keeping a percentage of assets in gold. Central banks have been net purchasers of gold since 2008. After several decades of selling gold by the ton, and shifting those resources to financial paper assets. Now, they're aggressive buyers. We've looked at the various kinds of investor demand. Very important is the second category, consumer demand. This is primarily in the form of jewelry. Now, what are the purposes served? You have intergenerational wealth transfers. You have wealth in a wearable form. It is often a culturally preferred gift and a means of savings outside the banking system. Lastly, in many parts of the world, it's used as collateral for loans from the banking system. While investor demand can be the, the swing vote in the gold market, which influences the short-term price trends, the vast majority of metals demand is in the latter consumer category. The critical element with consumer demand is the shift in geography of demand from west to east. We're witnessing a rapid evolution in the controlling interests of the metals markets. It's very evident that the handoff from the UK markets to the US markets nearly 100 years ago, that's being repeated again with the baton being passed to China. This is a market that already has several hundred million interested buyers versus a few million in total in the US and Europe. The changing economy in China will drive incomes and gold demand higher. With more disposable income, we'll see rising demand and higher prices in years to come. 14 banks import gold, they're all state controlled, Gold is then distributed through over 100,000 branches in both physical form as well as in savings accounts where the depositor has the option to buy in increments as small as one gram of gold in their account. While investor demand in the West has been fickle in the last 6, 12, 18 months, the East has and will continue to dominate the gold market. Within 36 to 48 months, that region will set the price for the world gold market as their futures and options market grow to rival that in the US. 
India will continue to take 700 to 1,000 tons of gold for consumers of jewelry, as will China, with China building out much of the infrastructure, which will propel Shanghai into the dominant trading capital for the world gold market. The transition is from being a price taker to a price maker by dominating both the physical and the futures markets. GDP per capita in China is about $7,958. That's one fifth of the US. Even a small marginal shift to 8,500 will benefit household income tremendously and the gold market with it. The government has decided to reorient the economy to the benefit of the consumer, which entails increased income as well as a stronger exchange rate. Both of these improve the consumer economy and consumer choices. Gold is already in the mix for your Chinese consumer. The West, including Europe and the United States, were the dominant end user of gold for both investment and consumer demand purposes. Over the last 30 years, that has shifted, and now Asia accounts for over 65% of total physical gold demand, with China and India alone accounting for over 50% of global demand. It is still the case that the price is set in the U.S. markets, given our robust futures trading. Consumption in the U.S. is a mere 6% of the global total. This geographic shift is a defining factor for the gold price over the next five to 10 years, not only as consumer purchases continue, but as central banks in the East, with a very low allocation to gold at present, seek to balance their reserve assets with gold. We've looked at the two forms of demand, that of investor demand and consumer demand. Now let's look at gold supplies. How scarce is gold? All the gold ever mined in the history of the world is 174,000 tons. That may sound like a lot, but it fits in two Olympic-size swimming pools. At $1,200 an ounce, that would be roughly $5.5 trillion in value. Now compare that to paper assets, stocks and bonds, which globally exceed over $200 trillion. You're looking at a market which is about 3% of the paper world. The first thing to appreciate is the inelasticity of the gold supply. This means that you cannot go out and radically increase supplies. Let's begin with the first source of supply, mining. Mine supply averages 2,500 tons per year. This number was far less in past eras and then rapidly increased to current levels with improvement in technology and now is in decline again. The richest ore bodies have already been mined. All the biggest producers from the 80s and 90s have lost ground to China, who is now the largest producer, and we noted previously consumer, of gold in the world. They're producing 400 tons per year. New major discoveries have fallen steeply over the last 15 years, with those having been found facing environmental concerns and significant political roadblocks. It takes seven to 10 years in a normal time frame to bring a new mine into production, and with so few moving towards this stage, supply constraints will be even greater over the next three to five to seven years. The second variable source of gold is from recycling of old gold. More recycling tends to occur with higher prices. Most recycling occurs in the West, and once an individual has sold their old pieces of gold or silver, they're done. They will not be back to sell what has already been sold, melted, or refashioned. This source has accounted for between 800 and 1,000 tons on average, and with increasing prices over the decade, has peaked near 1,600 tons, roughly 40% of the total in recent years. As the price has declined, so has scrap gold recycling, reflecting less motivation to sell and less product still available to sell. Then we have investor liquidations, which have never been a primary source of supply, but recently, because of the popularity of exchange-traded products, which, which we'll discuss in a moment, a substantial hoard of gold bars in London has been accumulated to back those products. Now, as much as 800 tons has been liquidated from this source in a single calendar year. And while adding to the depressed prices seen between 2012 and 2013, all of those ounces were snatched up by Chinese buyers in total. How do you own, how do you invest or, or play the markets in the precious metals? One's investment objectives will ultimately determine the appropriate vehicles. We're gonna start with a basic distinction between physical 
versus derivative products. Physical gold and silver can be segregated into three categories. Bullion, which are products like a coin or a bar priced near the melt value of gold or silver, sometimes referred to as the spot price. That's the price you'll find quoted in the daily paper. The advantages are cost-related primarily. The disadvantages are reportability on liquidation and, of course, past exposure to confiscation. We prefer bullion for overseas storage and for domestic retirement accounts. The next category is rare coins on the other extreme. They're priced primarily by their condition, scarcity, and age. The metal content is typically a small percentage of the total value. The advantages are having a highly concentrated form of portable wealth and appreciation potential beyond and usually unrelated to the metal in question. They're also not dealer reportable on liquidation. The disadvantages are primarily cost related and liquidity. They don't really maximize exposure to the precious metals. A third category is what we would call semi-rare or semi-collectible coins. They're priced according to gold content primarily with a small premium related to age, scarcity, and condition. The advantages bridge between bullion pricing on the one hand and the non-reportability on liquidation, just like their more rarefied cousins. We've found the best value in the European coin market where pricing is like that of the bullion fractional gold coin, but with age of 100 to 130 years old, most often in uncirculated original mint condition. Also of note is that these are produced by governments versus private refineries. Physical gold can be delivered to a client directly. It can be stored at a variety of global depositories, including in locations like Zurich, Toronto, Delaware, Hong Kong, Singapore. It can be placed inside retirement accounts, utilizing IRAs, 401ks, We've pioneered the gold industry for over 40 years and placed billions of dollars directly with clients offshore and inside domestic retirement accounts. This category, physical precious metals, is regarded as the best for insuring and hedging against the risks previously described. Then there are derivative products, which are simply products that derive their value from the metals in some way. Some are abstract contracts and some are concrete proxy relationships. First, you have futures and options, which are more abstract, and they were once used by producers to protect product delivery and pricing and ensure business continuity. Now, this is the primary playground of speculators placing leveraged bets. This is also where recent manipulations of price have centered and served as the trigger for significant ETF liquidations. Then there's ETFs, or exchange-traded products, exchange-traded funds, which are a proxy for the price of the metal. They trade like a stock with metals backing them, but not ordinarily deliverable to an investor. Last, there's mining stocks. This is owning a company that digs for the end product and develops a cash flow from ounces mined and sold, less, of course, the total expenses. In certain contexts, these are very rewarding and likely will be in the years ahead as they have underperformed the metal for a number of years. They do tend to catch up after lagging. Volatility is par for the course with the miners. This is a speculative category of investment with high promise. In the 1930s, even when gold was confiscated, this was an excellent proxy and provided upside and liquidity even while Washington bureaucrats were meddling with gold. How does the volatility of this bull market compare with the 1970s? To be clear, we are in a structural long-term bull market in gold and have experienced a short-term cyclical bear market. This is common in any asset class, following more or less a similar pattern of two steps forward and one step backward. Declines in the 1970s were in fact greater in severity even as gold rose from $35 an ounce to $875, a 2,500% move. On its way to $875, the price fell in a number of instances, 14%, 29%, 28%, 47, 11, 12, 20, 17, 43%. The declines in this bull market represent a normal volatility in the context of a super bull market. We've seen the price decline 22% in the current context, 15%, 29%, and the most recent one, 34%. Thus far, we have come from $272 to over $1,900. Corrections are and have been normal. We witnessed nine declines in the ebbs and flows of the 1970s bull market, and thus far, only four in the present context. 
we do expect more volatility in the future, but a finish to the bull market at considerably higher prices in the years ahead. Our perspective on the financial markets goes back to the 1960s. We were founded in 1972, and our family continues to own and operate the McIlvany Financial Group. ICA is our precious metals brokerage business with dozens of staff that have been with us between 20 and 30 years. Our wealth management business was put in place to assist clients with an exit or reduction strategy as we approach the end of a bull market in precious metals. Thus, we bring the best of a defensive allocation strategy in line with a growth-oriented strategy that encompasses all asset classes. We don't operate with quotas. We have virtually no turnover of staff. Our reputation in the industry and amongst clients is second to none. This enables our growth to be driven by referral business as we focus on cultivating long-term client relationships that encompass multiple generations. To serve each extended family, those of our clients, we provide ongoing education and insight through our audio weekly commentary, our regional conferences throughout the year, and a regular media production such as this. What should you do now? What is our advice? Continue in your commitment to education and critical thinking. Be sure to register for our weekly commentary to take full advantage of our ongoing support and education. Number two, Appraise your portfolio allocations and current risks. Refer to our resources online and include the perspective triangle as you see if you're balanced and prepared for the times that lie ahead. Number three, rebalance your portfolio. If you do not own gold and silver or would like to add to existing positions at low prices, convert greenbacks to ounces, stock positions to physical metals now. Number four, place a percentage of your net worth outside the United States or in a non-home country. We're moving towards global capital controls with desperate states only too willing to plunder your wealth. Bury a bone in every backyard. Number five, take advantage of premium fluctuations in an existing metals position. Premiums fluctuate on products like junk silver, US $20 gold pieces. Buying at low premiums, selling at high premiums, is an excellent way of compounding ounces using premiums to your advantage. Number six, ratio trades. Working with our advisors to capture growth, moving between bullion, gold, and silver, or between palladium and platinum. 40 years experience allows us to add value you won't find anywhere else. Price is not the only determinant of value. If you haven't developed a relationship with one of our advisors, you have no idea what's lacking in your precious metal strategies. Number seven, safeguard your retirement by rolling over your IRA or 401k into physical precious metals. Again, we know a thing or two about this, being the first firm in the country to place metals in IRAs in the mid 1980s. Number eight, discuss with our investment professionals long-term metals allocations, and future reallocations, what we've described as our reduction or exit strategy for a portion of your metals position as and when the metals move through the rest of their growth cycle. Put that cash or those ounces, if you will, to work for you. Number nine, pray for wisdom and guidance in all your financial decision making.